Hmm. Okay, so thanks, uh, thanks to everybody for joining us today. Welcome to our, our final conference of the the, the Reinforce uh, project. Um, it's a pleasure to to have you with us today. We'll be uh, working under the title Reinforcing Citizen Science in Large Research Infrastructures, the Delivery of a Policy Roadmap, which is one of our main deliverables in the project. My name is Gary Hemming. I am the Technical Manager of Reinforce. Um, and I'm also a member of the Virgo Collaboration and I work at the European Gravitational Observatory. And I've been uh, following the project for the last three years with uh, the various members uh, uh, that we have with us today of the project team. So we're, we're, I'll run through them quickly. We have uh, Francesco Moreddu from the, the Lisbon Council, uh, Theodore Ahabkitas from, uh, from CNRS, uh, Manolis Chaniotakis from EA, and we are also joined by Massimiliano Razzano from uh, the University of Pisa and Beatrice Garcia from, uh, from CONICET in, in Argentina. So thanks to all of you for joining us. And uh, we will be holding a, a round table uh, in a little while in which we'll discuss uh, various issues that we've, uh, we feel are, uh, are particularly relevant uh, following the, the three years experience that we've had. Yeah. In a moment, I'll ask Francesco to, to give a presentation that he's prepared on the, the preparation uh, of the, the, the policy roadmap. But I'll just begin with a, with a brief in sort of overview of the project um, and some of the, the results that we've, uh, we, we've been able to uh, uh, reach over the, the last few years. So I'm just going to share my screen. Okay. Uh, and I just go to slideshow here. Okay, so um, so what is Reinforce? Reinforce is a is a, a project which is uh, falls under the remit of the Horizon twenty twenty framework of the European Union, and it's part of the uh, the Science with and for Society uh, uh, funding uh, band. We had six sort of key goals in the project that we wanted to to attempt to obtain so one was to encourage uh citizens to engage in frontier science to create an active community of participants um to introduce the concept of responsible research and innovation in uh, in the citizen science landscape to assess the impact of, of citizen science in terms of uh, both society and uh, the, the scientific fields uh, to create a, a policy roadmap, which will be the, the sort of the broad focus of our discussion today, and also to, to look at the potential of citizen science to, uh, to promote inclusion and diversity in the field. We set up a collaboration of, of numerous partners from across yeah. Europe uh, and, and the wider world. Uh, I mentioned that we have Beatrice with us from Conocet, uh, who are based uh, in, in Argentina, but we have partners in the UK, in, uh, in Italy, in France, uh, in Greece, uh, in Belgium, uh, in Austria. You know, so we're, we are uh, we're, we're well broadly spread. Um, how did we? How did we set about achieving these goals? So once we had our collaboration, we we established um, four uh, demonstrator projects, citizen science demonstrator projects on uh, the Zooniverse uh, platform, which is a world leading uh, platform in the field of online citizen science, has more than a million users, has a, a wealth of experience and background for us to draw on. And uh, we had the benefit of having Oxford University as one of the partners in the collaboration, which enabled us to, to incorporate directly into our project team, our research teams for the different, uh, for the different demonstrator projects, the experience of members of the Zooniverse, uh, Zooniverse management team. So we, we took to set up these four projects, we focused on four different uh, frontier science fields. Uh, we took data from each of them and developed projects around them. So here we see a, an image of the, the Virgo gravitational wave develop, uh, uh, detector, which is based not far from where I'm, uh, where, where I'm speaking to you in Pisa. You see the, the, the Monte Pisano in the background. Uh, and we 
set up using the data from uh, from Virgo. We set up the Gwich Hunters project, um, and this was developed by uh, principally by uh, uh, Massimiliano, who, who will join us for the roundtable shortly, but also with re other various researchers from the from the University of Pisa, uh, along with us uh, at Ego. And in Witch Hunters, um, I mean, Massimiliano will be able to, to tell you about this in more detail later, um, but uh, we essentially ask uh, volunteers to help us to classify, to categorize and identify various types of glitch, which are transient noise features that we find in our, in our data from the Virgo uh, detector, and which uh, we have to for us are noise and we have to filter out of the uh out, out of our data sets because they can uh they can um they, they can block our field of view let's say in looking for uh the actual gravitational wave uh signals so uh volunteers are presented with with various glitch examples and then asked to to classify into specific classes i mean they're they're, they're taught uh, how to recognize these different classes and so on. There's a lot of information in the, the various instructions and field guides. And uh, uh, <clears throat> and one uh, particularly nice feature that we've added in the um, in the project is that we have uh, also asked them to once they classify a glitch, uh, we've asked them to to begin to help us identify the the source of that glitch. So. We will present a, a figure in uh, a glitch figure in the in our strain channel, in our, uh, which is used to actually uh, in which we recognise the gravitational wave signal, and we ask them to uh, to recognise to look for examples of that same glitch in what we call auxiliary channels, which are taken from various points around the interferometer. Obviously, we have thousands of different channels recorded at different frequencies uh, constantly. Um, but being able to match the glitch in these different auxiliary channels gives us a helping hand in understanding uh, potential sources of, of, of noise. So they are asked to recognize, you know, they're given different representations of the, the, the signals and so on, of the, the data at the same time, and they're, they're asked to, to, to try and help us classify them in that way. Next pro uh, project that we've developed is the Deep Sea Explorers project, which uses data from the KM3Net collaboration. M3Net collaboration has two neutrino detectors at the bottom of the, the Mediterranean, and they use these digital optical modules, these DOMs as they call them, to um, to study uh, Cherenkov radiation. So um, here we can see how these things are, these digital optical uh, modules are, are laid out at the, at the bottom of the Med. Um, they're set up in these these forests at the bottom of the sea, and they sit there or are chained there. Uh, all together, and let's see if, uh, if this will we can make this uh, play properly. But they sit there and they 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 measure the Cherenkov uh, radiation, which is a light which is provoked by the passage of a charged particle like an electron through a medium, in this case the seawater, at a velocity which is higher than the phase velocity of light. So it provokes this this kind of light, which these DOMs are then able to to recognize. So these two, uh, uh, these two um, fields of, uh, of, of digital optical modules are located in two locations in the Med. So one is 20 kilometers to the south of Toulon uh, in the south of France, and, and another is 40 kilometers to the south of Sicily, um, right off the very foot uh, where you can see Catania there. Uh, so there's Capo Passo you know, right at the very, very foot of Sicily. And there, there is the, uh, the Arca detector out there. And these are installed via these loading object modules, as they called. They're sort of loaded into these spheres, dropped to the bottom of the sea, low, not dropped, lowered to the bottom of the sea. Uh, and then they they are allowed to uh, return to the surface and and they distribute the the uh, the, the doms as they go. So I've got a, a, some footage here, which hopefully uh, can show you this. They're lower to the bottom of the sea, released, and they roll back up to the surface and they release these these digital optical modules as they go. So. 
uh, there's just a nice example there of one of these uh, these digital optical modules or DOMs uh, chained to the uh, uh, all chained up and ready to go. Uh, and there's one in situ at 3,000 meters uh, deep uh, recording this information. So, uh, so what did we do with the data from KM3Net? Well, we set up two uh, two workflows, as they're called in Zooniverse. One related to bioluminescence and one related to bioacoustics. So um, these are objects which are uh, recording light. Obviously, uh, at that depth, uh, you're hoping that there's not much environmental light around, but there is some which is produced uh, in the form of bioluminescence by various different creatures and which um, kind of dirt is slightly the 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 data that we have for the uh for the detectors so uh, we ask uh volunteers to contribute to the project by helping to recognize these um the these forms of bioluminescence so by teaching them to how to understand where uh where they appear in the data you know due to the number of peaks that 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 may appear over a, a specific number of time we can interpret those to understand whether it's uh they're, they're sort of uh, being formed sporadically by by uh by bioluminescence in in the local environment uh and so volunteers help by by classifying that in addition uh around the detectors we have hydrophones so that's underwater microphones and volunteers are also tasked with helping us to to understand to better understand the uh the local environment so we have marine biologists who are involved in the research team as well and they volunteers are asked to 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 look at and to listen to the signals as they are uh as they're they're, they're provided and to help us to understand whether uh, those signals are coming from a sperm whale or short fin uh, pilot whale or etc in order to help us better understand the the, the local environment at the bottom of the sea uh, surrounding the, the detectors third uh, project that we have is the new particle search at CERN which is uh, developed using uh, data from the atlas detector at the large hadron collider and we have a, a team who have developed, uh, uh, let's say, a more complex uh, project, but ultimately one which has been very, very engaging for, for volunteers. In, it's separated out across different workflows or stages, as they, they refer to them in, in the project here. And volunteers are essentially asked to help to identify uh, the signatures of long-lived particles. So these they look for, they're given uh different topological representations of the the various uh, elements of the detector and they are asked to recognize and identify and highlight uh these so-called displaced vertices uh which are left um through the uh, through, thanks to the passage of the of the different particles uh through the different uh areas of the detector um so they'll They'll have to draw onto the screen the different uh, the different areas that they you know, the different lines that they recognise these different vertices that they are able to uh, distinguish, and as they move through uh, the project, they move into a, an aspect which is uh, very innovative for for a, a Zooniverse project in that they actually the more complex uh, the actions become, they end up having to move out of Zooniverse and into an entirely bespoke uh, application set up by the uh, Yaza team uh, in Athens uh, to, um, to allow them to undertake some really quite complex uh, calculations uh, and uh, a series of tasks which become, uh, which are not straightforward. Um, and they've, uh, they've developed around this project a very keen core group of volunteers who have become very well informed uh, and uh, um, have become very close to 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 the the, the research team the, themselves beyond that we have our fourth demonstrator project which is cosmic muon images and which is uh, developed uh, using data from a diaphragm de detector which uh a muon detector which has uh, uh, been recording data in different uh, different periods 
Um, and the, uh, the workflow that we have set up so far has been based around the, the uh, usage of data from recorded from Atumulus in Greece uh, in 2019, I'm going to say, but I might be wrong with the, with the date, but uh, you know, it's, not, it's not too important. Um, but what do volunteers do in this project? They, uh, they are asked to, to identify the passage of particles through the, the different levels of the detector. So they are given a 3D representation and they, they are asked to try and recognize, a to, to draw uh, onto the screen uh, the, the passage of, uh, of a particle as it passes through those different layers. And they're giving Alongside that, they're given a two-dimensional representation of the different layers as well to, to help them understand. Beyond that, I'm going to stop talking a moment and pass the floor to Francesco, but I just want to mention, I mean, we've done a lot of different uh, things in the project beyond the four demonstrator projects. Um, Beatrice will tell us uh, a little later about the work that's gone into sonification, the development of the, the, the uh, Sonorna web tool, which has been uh, a key uh innovative uh deliverable of the of the project and is now uh, fully available and online and they've uh, I, I won't go into great deal detail now because uh Beatrice will, will be able to tell us all about it but they've they've also uh the, the team in Argentina have also developed a series of resources they've been very very busy in uh in engaging with people as well um just a couple of photos here you can see of of, uh, of kids involved in in helping them to, to 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 develop the application because they are all of their, their development is based on on uh, user user uh, user testing user feedback so they have different groups with whom with they've worked uh for that we have a, 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 a powerful citizen engagement strategy, which Manolis will be able to talk, tell us about shortly. I won't go into detail, but it's around, involved around these, these five levels, these five key levels of informing, involving, collaborating, consulting, and empowering. So he'll be able to tell us about that later. So in terms of informing, we've done a lot of uh, a lot of activities, uh, attended a lot of conferences. We've done a lot of training courses in terms of involving. Uh, collaborating there have been all kinds of challenges that have taken place consulting again there's been a lot of back and forth and feedback with different uh, different uh, volunteer communities and in terms of empowering as well i'll, I'll let manolis uh, give more information on, on that uh, on that shortly we've had we've we've uh, put in place a uh, a critical and scientific thinking course, which um, was launched by uh, the Nobel Prize winner Saul Perlmutter, uh, uh, and uh, subsequently developed here here at uh, at Ergo uh, recently. Um, we've been involved in very many uh, artistic uh, conferences. The uh, reinforcers sat really at the the nexus of art and science in in many respects. And we've been involved in a number of important uh, installations. We've uh, on a on a more local level, well, I say local, but it's really uh, on a on a on a less uh, international level. To some in some degrees, let's say, we've set up uh, a couple of uh, art and science contests for for kids from four to twelve years of age, and then from twelve to eighteen. Um, and they were a lot of fun, and we were very engaging for people. Um, and you know, we we uh, we aimed them at these two different bands, and we, and we ended up with this was our our winner for uh, for the four to to twelve uh, section, um, who was from uh, a young artist from Bahrain, uh, and then from the the thirteen to eighteen section, this was was ultimately our, our winner. Um, We've another innovative aspect of the project has been the uh, a course that we've developed on uh, physics for seniors, senior citizen scientists, which was uh, run essentially by Ego and the, uh, the University of Pisa. And we've done this with a local group here in Cascina near to Pisa, not far from where the, uh, the, the Virgo director is, is located. And that was a big success. And beyond the life of the project, we will continue to exploit that. And we have another, pro another. we've developed a program again, uh, which has already begun for the, this, this academic year, uh, which involve, will involve uh, with the same, same group, one course of roughly an hour uh, a month. Uh, that's been a lot of, a lot of fun. 
just a couple of photos of when they came to visit us on site. Um, okay, so we've got various elements then as well of our, of our dissemination, so to do with social media, various dem dissemination uh, activities, lots of synergies that have been developed and so on. Um, there have been a lot of collaborations built up with relevant stakeholders. I won't go through them all. Uh, you can see, see there that uh, just how many there are. Um, our social media has been very active, so I, you know, I encourage you to, to to go and have a look. There's a lot of uh, nice information there. Uh, we've put together a series of webinars as well, which are all available on our, our website um, with you know other roundtables and workshops and so on in the past. Uh, also appeared on the BBC Sky at Nice. We've been uh, quite uh, you know quite active in terms of sort of broad. Uh, uh, dissemination, dissemination activities in general, just a few examples of you know, when we've been to, to visit people or people have come to visit us. Uh, there's a whole uh, element of the project as well, which has involved the actual evaluation of, of understanding how, how effective our different strategies have been. And we have various deliverables that are have either been published in relation to this or are due to be published very shortly. So that's, uh, there's a lot of information there for, for people to, 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 to draw on. Um, just slightly more from the, the evaluation there. Okay, so that's me done. I thank you for your for your time, and I hope I've given you a, <laughs> some uh, background yeah. for for the project. Um, yeah. I see that there are a couple of questions in the chat. Okay, yeah. so for now it's just Francesco. So in, at this point, uh, Francesco, I'll, I'll pass the ball to you, and uh, and you can tell us about the roadmap. Thank you, thank you, Gary. Uh, sorry for my voice. Uh, I'm a little sick. I don't have COVID. Don't worry. <laughs> it's just the, the normal, uh, you know, normal flu. Okay. So my name is uh, Dr. Francesco Moredo, and I am a senior director at the Lisbon Council. I think they uh, based in Brussels, and um, I'm, I've been mostly engaged uh, in um, the work package elaborating the sustainability plan and uh, the roadmap. Uh, so basically, the and the, the roadmap, which is due by the end of the month, which is going to be finished, uh, I promise, uh, by the uh, the end of the of the week. Uh, so the roadmap basically wants to give some recommendations about uh, how to involve uh, citizens uh, in uh, uh, large research infrastructure. So how to perform uh, citizen science in that. Uh, in that regard, so the <clears throat> the questions that the roadmap. Uh, <clears throat> I wanted to uh, to answer, and that will answer is basically um, what is the value added of citizen science, which is a broad, let's say, question also in other parts of the project. What are the bottlenecks and uh, and uh, gaps uh, that have to be addressed in order to mainstream uh, uh, citizen science in research infrastructure? especially for what concerns the incentives for citizens, the attribution of scientific research um, uh, results, uh, mainstreaming of common approaches, data quality and interoperability. And finally, what are the policies that uh, should be put in place uh, to foster the implementation of citizen science in research infrastructures? So this is uh, a sketch of the methodology for developing the, the roadmap. So starting from the project results and, and lessons learned, we elaborated a set of dry drivers and barriers, and then a set of policy objectives. Uh, those policy objectives have been uh, um, matched with respect to existing policy measures in order to devise policy gaps and policy challenges. Then, uh, starting from, with the policy challenges, we had a lot of input uh, in, in the workshops, of course, the last one in, in Pisa at the beginning of the month, a lot of input from, uh, um, from the advisory committee, a lot of input from other experts that uh, uh, you know, are part of the community, and also uh, a lot of input from, uh, from, from partners in order to elaborate the, the recommendations, which is, uh, will be finalized in a, in a matter of, uh, of days. So this is the structure of the roadmap. So clearly, the first part is that the methodology. So what is a road mapping exercise? Uh, what is uh, the methodology for the gap analysis? What input has been collected, uh, like uh, input from the researcher, from events, uh, input from the, the roadmap in commentable format. So the, the roadmap, uh, part of the roadmap, 
has been presented in commentable format through a, a tool called Making Speech Talk, so that um, interest people who, who were able to uh, to input their their inputs and their feedback. And then, uh, as I said, we, we elaborated uh, um, uh, lessons learned from the project, identification of gaps, policy challenges. Finally, we um, structured the, the, the roadmap with recommendations for follow-up actions. We are not sure if to keep uh, this structure recommendation at EU level, national, regional level, but probably we are going to to do, do just a, um, a set of policy recommendations uh, overall. And then uh, we um, we also uh, discussed, uh, let's say, uh, action plans for implementation, challenges and opportunities, and a final feasibility uh, analysis. So for all concerns, the policy objectives, uh, we have a set of 14 policy objectives. Uh, those are, you know, I can give now just some examples uh, in that, the, you know, they, they will be obviously free to, to be consulted in, in the roadmap, for instance, uh, uh, support uh, um, to support access to uh, uh, open access to, to, um, to open and cloud-based solutions for advanced computing and data analytics in research and innovation, or support establishment and enlargement, enlargement of an open data space for scientists and citizen scientists. Uh, we talk about standards and we talk about facilitating collaboration between uh, researcher and citizen scientists. Uh, other interesting are, for instance, increase uh, the IT literacy uh, for, for citizens that can be interested in science and in, uh, in citizen science in general, or to make citizen science more inclusive by promoting gender balance. This is also one of the topics that is uh, that is um, uh, then addressed in let's say new calls of horizon europe that will be published uh, published very soon other final uh, let's say policy objectives uh, uh, and the development of an impact assessment framework show the effectiveness of this citizen science or uh, uh, raise awareness among citizens and scientists and scientific community regarding the significant contributions that citizens can provide in collecting valuable evidence uh, for, uh, for instance, for measuring impact indicators. So some of these policy objectives were also the objectives of the, of the project and, has been, and have been fulfilled by the project uh, itself. Uh, then we elaborated a set of policy challenges in the map with respect of the policy objectives. Um, also in this case, going through <clears throat> weekly policy, um, policy challenges, for instance, about data quality and management. In fact, we, we have uh, the creation of large data sets that should be uh, uh, through, let's say, monitoring, observing and, and crowdsourcing, which, uh, you know, uh, it opens uh, some, some series of implications. Also, data harmonization is one of the, of the challenge because we have data collected for specific purposes. Uh, we have uh, um, administration and governance uh, challenges uh, regarding to funding citizen science, uh, for instance, uh, that has different funding needs when, uh, compared with uh, traditional scientific projects. Inclusion and diversity, of course, uh, uh, this is also one of the, of the core the objectives of the project was to uh, to boost as much as possible inclusion. In fact, uh, there have been there has been a lot of work related to um, obviously to uh, to help underserved communities to be uh, to get access to to citizen science projects and and experiments. Uh, co-creation co-creation is also one of the of the policy challenges uh, related uh, you know with the fact that uh, citizen science uh, it's really the highest degree of citizen part participation into scientific research because it entails a, a real research uh, carried out also by 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 citizens uh final policy challenges uh, uh, like um, what we we spoke about before so uh, the existence of formal the, the necessity to boost formal and informal learning environments or for instance the the project uh, the project uh, evaluation 
For what concerns the, the policy recommendations, uh, they are a set of uh, uh, about 15. Uh, okay, there are some questions. Maybe we can answer the questions uh, later uh, after they're finished. So for instance, introducing citizen science in educational strategy. So this entails, uh, uh, let's say, um, try to uh, introduce uh, citizen science uh, in, into into schools and into into universities as uh, where science education where is, is taught where where science is taught boosting of course evaluate on evaluation and monitoring of citizen science and in fact in our project there is a, a, a work package there are several tasks that are basically uh, pushing in that uh, that direction including educators in, in program design, uh, community establishment, uh, um, scale up, sustain and engagement. In this, uh, in this that regard, uh, I mean, it's, um, it's very important, uh, it's core that uh, the communities that are created uh, through citizen science are somehow uh, sustained and engaged. So there, there, we need, there is the need for a continuous engagement of those, uh, those communities. <coughs> Uh, here, very important are, for instance, uh, pro pro prioritizing uh, STEM in education. In fact, uh, only uh, if uh, um, science, technology, uh, mathematics are pushed in education, uh, uh, then uh, citizen science itself, especially in religious infrastructure, will be, will be pushed uh, downstream. And uh, this will be done uh, also promoting exchanges of, of uh, best practices uh, and uh, increasing, uh, increasing, for instance, the, the funding. And what is important here is also try to, to have a kind of a gender balance. Uh, in fact, uh, basically, the, the idea is to, uh, to try to push as much as possible uh, participation of, uh, of females to, to STEM education and then um, the, to push the, uh, the females to, to pierce scientific, uh, scientific uh, careers. Other um, interesting recommendation that came out, came out also uh, during the, the workshop in Pisa are the necessity to have new rules of attribution of uh, scientific uh, discoveries. Uh, in fact, uh, um, citizen scientists are, uh, let's say, um, you know, involved in uh, 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 let's say are involved in uh, elaborating uh, uh, research so i mean uh, this has to be to be recognized and also the fact that uh, um, you know also the uh, um, establishment of citizen science scientific journals would be important uh, in that uh, in that sense also boosting the european open science cloud is an important um, is an important topic uh, because uh, uh, it's, it would be possible, let's say, and, and, uh, and uh, let's say useful to uh, support, uh, um, to push uh, the creation of an open cloud data space for citizen science uh, at EU level in the European open science uh, cloud. Uh, final recommendations, uh, uh, career boosting skill on citizen science. Uh, in order to uh, to uh, let's say help citizens in uh, in in being interested to citizen science uh, um, initiatives, but also increase the awareness among uh, among scientists on uh, let's say uh, on the extent of, um, of to on to what extent citizen science might be useful for for them, support funding in this sense. Uh, um, the European Commission uh, in Horizon Europe uh, does not have uh, any more the SWOFs, Science Sweden for Society line of funding, but uh, there is uh, the WIDERA uh, line of funding, uh, which is uh, interesting for, uh, for citizen science. And finally, to involve uh, clearly policy making through, uh, policymakers through all the projects' uh, life cycles. Um, so um, finally, uh, we have uh, continued to pursue and encourage diversity, which is what we have been doing for for the with the um, with the project uh, uh, so far, and what we are going to do also after the end of the project. Mm. 
and uh, and finally uh, evaluation so uh, talking about uh, the the development uh, of uh, um let's say in, in, of meta evaluation of citizen science impact assessment frameworks and uh, and uh, tools so this is just you know in a few uh, in a few minutes what the the roadmap is about and uh, uh, we are going to have a final version by the end of the month uh, freely available so that uh, for us the the debate will be only a start because there will be new projects in the future Thanks very much for that, Francesco. So uh, there have already been a few questions on on, uh, on the the, the Q and A. Um, I invite anybody who's following to you know to feel free to uh, to post them and we'll answer them as uh, as soon as we can. Uh, hopefully during the talk. Um, so I'll just go go through them. So in terms of the availability availability of the, the slides that have been presented here, these will be made available as Francesco has, has replied. Um, these will be made available uh, on our web page uh, in the next 48 hours. So you'll be able to uh, get access to them there. And here we have an, another question. So are these policy recommendations available, for example, in, in a deliver, deliverable? If yes, please provide a link. Yeah. Uh, in a few coming. days, you know, a few days, yeah. the, the document will be available, and we will send it to everybody, of course, uh, uh, to all the um, the attendees uh, today. But you know, it's going to be available at Gaomnes. Yeah, that that deliverable is one of the key deliverables of the the project. So uh, that's that's due to arrive soon. So thanks, Francesco. Okay, so. At this this point, I'd like to open our roundtable session, and I would like to to pose a couple of questions. Um, again, please feel free to to make any comments in the chat or pose any questions that you would like answered. Um, but the first question I, I would like to aim at Manolis Janiotakis, who has um, been working over the last three years on our work package eight uh which has been to do uh with uh engagement and participation and uh, manolis simple question maybe requiring a probably a very complex and long answer but how do you maintain and retain interest and involvement in citizen science projects this is a quite hard question <laughs> First of all, um, there are multiple factors that uh, someone needs to take into account. Uh, the first one is the appeal of the project itself, uh, meaning the content and the, the science behind it. And of course, the way that the science is presented and perhaps the time correlation between uh, the launching of the project and perhaps a Nobel Prize, let's say. So these are things that affect the launch of the project. In order to, from our experience, and in order to uh, keep uh, our community engaged, uh, we need to continuously be there for them. So this is, uh, I, and I think uh, I definitely see Angela in uh, in the team here of attendees. So she might be able to to tell us. She was a participant in the summer school. So the first thing is that uh, let's say. Um, a community needs to be built, and the community means that uh, both researchers and citizen scientists dedicate some time for a productive dialogue. Uh, and uh, to that, Theodore and Massimiliano might be able to tell you much, much more. From our part, um, we need to offer the science in a coherent, understandable way uh, in tasks that are not very difficult to discourage people, but not that easy in order to be like you know a playground and uh, beyond that one needs to keep uh, triggering um, the community you know offering opportunities to go deeper to go beyond offering challenges and uh, in order let's say to build a stronger community of committed uh, participants and on the other hand one needs to reach out uh, to be as inclusive as possible uh, to reach out to new audiences, find ways to, you know, change the, um, 
the barriers into enablers. So, for example, what uh, Beatrice and her team are doing, meaning that uh, we are actually through sonorization, we are reaching out to a new audience and uh, we are all trying to offer uh, an equal opportunity. So, uh, you focus, on one hand, you focus on activities that will, you know, uh, strengthen the ties of the community, will immerse uh, participants more, will give them motivation to produce more scientific output, like challenges, for example. And on the other hand, you organize activities that, uh, you know, have a broader reach in order to invite more people to participate and join you. So these are, I think, the most uh, important uh, parts here. What, what have you, thanks for that, Manolis, what, do you, what have you been able to identify in these projects uh, as the most significant barriers to access, do you think? The most significant barriers. Uh, the, this is actually a very good question, again. Uh, this might differ from project to project. Uh, Rainforest is a research project, and uh, our main goal was to understand our community, to understand who they are, what motivates them, and uh, how we can be more efficient in including them from one hand and uh, increasing scientific output on the other hand. So, uh, I would say that this was a road full of barriers, and, uh, but also full of enablers. Uh, we needed to constantly uh, monitor uh, engagement and constantly find, okay, when people stop classifying, why do they do that? We need to, we need to join and uh, to, take, to mitigate the actions. The coordination, I think, the, the most difficult part that uh, we had to, let's say, face uh, was that the um, coordination, very strong coordination, was required from different stakeholders. And this was difficult and very rewarding because we succeeded in that in Rainforest, meaning that the research team needed to be there to support and they did it. The engagement team needed to be there to support and they did it. The sonorization team needed to yeah. be there and they did it. So the success of the yeah. of a citizen science project requires cooperation and uh, this is a hard part, but I think we were successful. Thanks, Manolis. Very interesting. Again, uh, just before I move on to the next question, because I want to, to move on to a, a slightly different topic, but bef before I do, just a reminder that if anybody wants to post any comments or questions, then please feel free. Uh, we'll certainly pick those up. Now, the, the next uh, the next question I, I would like to ask, I would like to ask uh, to the two members of of the project research teams that we have with us today. So of the four demonstrator projects, two of them are represented uh, here uh, in the form of Massimiliano and Theodore. Uh, so Massimiliano has been the lead for, for the Quick Chances project and Theodore uh, has, has been doing so much work on, on cosmic muon images. And so the, the question, which I'll, I'll first put to Massimiliano and then I'll pass it to you, Theodore, um, is how do you design a successful citizen science project in, in a large research infrastructure in, in, from your point of view? Well, thank you, Gary. This is a very interesting question. And this was basically the question that asked ourselves when we started with these projects. Uh, for, uh, I think that based on our experience with, with chanters, I think that's the first uh, step is to try to understand what are the most compelling science goal that we wanted to uh, convey with this, uh, with this demonstrator and with this project. Uh, in the case of gravitational wave, uh, uh, we, we, we strive to show to, to the citizens how important was the study of the of the the background noise because this is really where the science is and uh, and so um, starting from this idea we 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 try to to convert this idea into some tasks that could be uh, easy to perform on a platform like the universe. And, and so we, 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 we try to analyze in a more detailed uh, 
uh, what were the, 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 the most important uh, aspects of the noise that we wanted to study. Uh, for gravitational wave, we also had uh, the experience of, of our fellow project, Gravity Spy. So we, we tried to learn from that experience and try to do to prepare something that was complementary to what Gravity Spy was doing. And that's where we came out with the tasks that we have in in uh, in, in Witch Hunter. So I think first of all is to have something that is compelling. Second is something that is clear, like a clear target, clear goal. And third one is something that is uh, easy to do uh, on on a say citizen science platform base. So I think these are the, the three main uh, main aspects that we we kept into consideration in designing this, this demonstrator. Thanks very much, Max. Very, I, 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 I'd highlight there the, the importance of making things very clear. I think that's maybe something that uh, you know, we, we can come back to in a moment, because I think that the, the, the importance of using accessible language and what we, what do I mean by accessible and so on? We can discuss shortly, but I think uh, it's a very important point as well. Theodore, would you like to? Can you give us your perspective on, on that? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> so um, yeah, I, I really, I really try to to understand uh, what um, one considers uh, to be success. Because, um, okay, if, if you take it in the very narrow uh, perspective of achieving your scientific goal, achieving what you wanted to understand from your project, then of course, this is a, a measure. But uh, there are also other things that uh, you need to understand as a success. And uh, Success is that you are reaching out to people and you are making them do work that they haven't done before, that you are making them see in practical terms what is your scientific endeavor and how you, what is the, the, the issues that you face as a scientist. So, of course, if you are a very a large research infrastructure, uh, I would uh, I would uh, expect that uh, your uh, your research uh, project is a very good and uh, uh, so in a solid base uh, foundation has a solid has a solid foundation, but. Uh, uh, the next step towards success is how you incorporate your citizen science project in your other activities. So if someone uh, <laughs> just takes what was happening in Rainforest with all the, the activities and all the, the virtual visits and to try to find ways to, to put the, the citizen science project in these activities, then I believe that the, the participation is going to be uh, not an issue and uh, you are going to have uh, uh, indeed a very successful uh, a very successful project. So this is uh, because you know we are the, the smaller uh, the smallest of the of the projects in uh, from these four demonstrators. Uh, this is uh, something that uh, we were missing. Uh, we would like to have uh, this uh, large uh, uh, infrastructure behind us uh, in order to to be able to do much more things that uh, than than what uh, we did. Not with respect to the scientific goals, but with respect to the side projects that we believe are uh, maybe more important than uh, than the than the scientific goal itself. So this is my perspective on that. So you feel that these the the side projects are are more effective ultimately for a for a smaller project uh, like yours than uh, 
uh, just I'm just trying to make sure I've understood correctly. You know? So for for because cosmic muon images is slightly uh, like you said doesn't doesn't have the large research infrastructure behind that the other three do. I, uh, yeah. And so in your case, uh, you feel that these the sort of the smaller side projects that develop along with uh, the main project can be uh, can be as beneficial. I believe that the brand name of your uh, infrastructure plays a very significant role to yeah. how people perceive your uh, project and uh, how willing they are to oversee some of your flaws, let's say. So, but uh, it, it, is a, it is a discussion that uh, I believe also the, the roadmap uh, addresses and uh, it is that how a large research, research infrastructure is going to have a, a separate, let's say, a function within it to, to think about potential citizen science project based on what they see within the, within the collaboration. So this is what I, what I believe. Yeah, very interesting. Thanks, Theodore. Okay. At that point, then I would like to move on to a different question, which this time I would like to uh, to ask uh, to Beatrice. And you remember that Beatrice has been working as part of the the team working on sonification and the development of Sonor. Uh, and so, Beatrice, my question to you is. From your point of view, how do you how do you build a community of volunteers, participants? Um, how, how do you build a community that is that is diverse? Hello, can you hear me? Uh, well, um, now I think we have a community not a big one, but uh, we need to grow in this sense, the, the participation of the people, because our participation in Rainforce is a bit different than the others, the others, the, the demonstrators, for example. We, we are in charge of a transversal project to propose a new, a new way to approach the nature. It means uh, in general, the, the science is devoted to produce images and um, visualizations. And the idea is to permit the people who cannot see mainly uh, to access the same thing, the same tools and the same possibilities to be part of the um, uh, scientific uh, project or a citizen science project like Rainforce. In this sense, uh, we we start we begin in this uh, in this uh, organization this big group of four demonstrators because we had a a, a, a very very draft version of a sonorization proposal uh, based in the um, in the user center design. It means uh, trying to offer a, a tool developed with the help of the users. And in this sense, it was very interesting because our first step was to understand the demonstrators to sonorize the data. And after that, to offer the tool to the rest of the volunteers in Rainforce. So it was a very interesting um, road to follow, we follow. And, um, and now we have some volunteers, not only for sonorization, but also to offer all the tools in different languages. Because when we talk about, about inclusion, normally the inclusion is connected with any disability. But um, part of the inclusion is also to have all the, all the tools, all the resources, all the opportunities accessible for any country. And uh, well, as you know, the English is the common language, the more or less common language right now, but not all the people who speak English. So um, as part of our um, summer school, the last summer school, uh, we also 
realize that we have volunteers all over the world. And now we are improving our, our development, uh, the, the Sono Uno uh, software, which is not only um, a user-centered development for the beginning or from the beginning, but also it's a multi-platform, uh, completely open source um, a tool. And um, because of that, we are trying to generate a, a server, the, an accessible tool for everyone from everywhere and to offer the tools. Without volunteers, it's impossible to improve this kind of proposal, the open, the open sources um, development like the software. And in the case of the inclusion, if you permit uh, to me, I will share one just one slide that um, we love a lot, which is this one. Mm, permit to me to put this in this way. I change a little because we are now in the, in the football wave, but um, as you can see, is uh, the, the inclusion is more than give all the tools. You can give the tools and also we can we can uh, distribute the tools according the the different uh, approaches to the nature and you can assure equity but uh, to talk about inclusion you need to remove all the barriers and is what we try to do with sono uno with our participation in reinforce and with the volunteers in the project Thanks, Beatrice. So, um, considering that, Beatrice, how important do you think that the concept of co-design is? It's very important, mainly because you can access the 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 Sono Uno uh, uh, scripts. It means. Uh, you have the possibility to improve the script, to improve the software, to change the software, and to offer a better product to the others. So the co-creation is part of the, um, the um, uh, methodology in open, so uh, open sources development in, in general. So uh, for us, it's one of the most important things, the co-creation, to have a better, a better tool, a better offer, and to permit the people uh, be part, as the name is uh, uh, indicates, uh, be part of the of the proposal. In this sense, um, I must say that um, this is the science today. It's not just for education, not just for outreach. It's also for research. Without this kind of approach, it's impossible to grow in science because uh, the data are a lot. The challenge are very big, very, very big, and we need more people. Not all the people will have the opportunity to be a scientist, but there are a lot of citizens with the, with the feeling of the science, with the, with the um, a passion for the science, and we need all of them. Thanks, Beatrice. Thanks very much. In relation to that, so in relation to the concept of co-design, um, I think there's an interesting point, an interesting discussion point to be had, um, which I'll bring back to Theodore and to, to Massimiliano in terms of community building. So you have been able to build communities of volunteers of, of participants in your projects thanks to the work of manolis and uh, and the team at ea who have developed all of their engagement activities but there is also an important aspect in the form of the talk facility the talk forum facility on Zooniverse. How important 
was the that talk uh, functionality been for the success of your your projects of building uh, communities in your projects? I give I give that one to you, Theodore, first. So uh, the talk boards. Uh, were, uh, are very important and uh, it is very important because you are uh, communicating uh, with people that are uh, uh, giving their time and uh, they are also giving feedback and uh, they want to to see how you how how you behave and how you how you manage all these uh, responsibility uh, the the experience is uh, for me at least very positive because um, since my attitude is uh, for people to learn uh, while I'm uh, writing, uh, we have uh, fruitful discussions on uh, the demonstrator. Uh, similar discussions, uh, as you said, Gary, that we had uh, during the the events that Manol is. Uh, uh, organized for us. So, uh, in principle, uh, the the talk is uh, very similar to to how people uh, behave. So, either in person or through the talk, the community building uh, is a question mark for me because uh, I don't know. Uh, how long last uh, is this uh, going to be? During my during my experience with a demonstrator, all these months, uh, I felt uh, uh, this um, this unity with uh, the people that are helping us. It remains to see how this uh, continues on uh, through through time. Thanks, Theodore. Uh, Massimiliano? Uh, yeah, well, I think that uh, having the possibility of using the the, the talk features on, on the universe, I think it, it helped very much because it is a uh, sort of, uh, you know, sequel of what we discussed during this event, uh, communication events, engagement events that Manolis put together. Uh, because they basically establish a continuous uh, a place where we can continuously discuss about uh, various various things, and uh, this is also a place where we can communicate the results that we got, um, news, and also uh, where we can you know news about uh, activities or you know um, challenges and so on. And and also it's a, it's a great place to uh, offer challenges to to the to the citizen. So definitely, I think that the forum helped a lot in order to create a community that is is growing. Thanks, Massimiliano. We have a a question from uh, I I believe. Forgive me if I mispronounce this, but I think from Git Krag. Uh, apologies if I pronounce that uh, poorly. Um, so regarding our participants, so will our demonstrator projects continue on Zooniverse after Reinforce ends? It's a really important question, I think. And if not, will participants be encouraged to participate in other Zooniverse citizen science projects? And do you think they would? And why? And why not? So I will... I'll provide a, a, my initial response to this, and then I, I will pass pass it on to the the other participants. Now, um, I think if the answer differs slightly for each of the four different projects. Uh, the one which I am most closely linked to, uh, it obviously is the Gwich Hunters, um, part of the, the the research team of the project, uh, and you know, we are actively looking to see exploring uh, possibilities of uh, using some of the resources of the Virgo collaboration and the Virgo collaboration is uh, a scientific collaboration of more than 800 people across Europe so we're, you know we're looking at, at ways in which we can get people involved 
somehow in that. Um, regarding the other the other three projects, I mean, Theodore will speak for, for Cosmic Muon Images. Um, sadly, we don't have representatives from the other two here today to answer, but certainly there is a the intention to, to maintain uh, these projects if, uh, as far as possible, to continue to exploit them. Certainly Manolis has uh, a great deal of, uh, um, of hope that we will continue to uh to uh you know to to exploit them for for the, the for the purposes of, of continued uh promotion of, of participant uh participation and, and participant engagement regards the um encouragement to participate in other other zooniverse uh or citizen science projects um certainly from the witch hunters perspective we have a kind of cousin uh uh, project which is gravity spy uh, which is uh, developed by the LIGO LIGO scientific collaboration and we already have some crossover of, of volunteers between the two and what we've found as well is that uh, the the sort of the uh, many users many volunteers sorry I shouldn't use the word users but many volunteers who come to participate in the projects uh, are are often already participating in other Zooniverse projects as, as it is. So the, I think an area which could be very interesting for us to explore in the in the longer term is, is to identify particularly new new volunteers who come to Zooniverse specifically via our our projects to uh, see how they continue to engage with us in the longer term, but also to see how they continue to engage with Zooniverse in the form of other projects. Um, but I will pass. I, I will pass this question first on to Theodore. So, Theodore, in terms of cosmic muon images, uh, what, what do you think? Yes, uh, actually, uh, yesterday, uh, now that we was discussing, we were discussing about the talk. We had this uh, uh, question on the talk board on the, um, what is the future with uh, the data and uh, where is if there is a a finish line for for this project uh, my so the, the, this is uh, the, the answer is the following we have uh, two more data sets uh, that uh, are currently active and probably this is going to take up a couple of months if uh, uh, i understand correctly the participation uh, after that, uh, we are going to to upload data uh, in these two workflows that we have from uh, a, a volcano in uh, Iceland, which is uh, the the volcano from where you were going in the center of the Earth in the Jules Verne uh, novel, and. Uh, uh, we think this is uh, uh, another step because, the, uh, and I'm sorry that I'm taking all this time, but one of the problems that we had was that we have so many applications for muon tomography, and because of the of the structure of the site, we could only uh, extensively refer to the to the archaeological tomography. So we want to start expand to the other applications as well. And the other uh, thing is that we need at some point to see how we will create two new workflows to start uh, testing uh, our reconstruction, uh, our uh, imaging algorithms for tomography, which is, uh, okay, it, it, it's a lot of work, but this is the plan. We continue with these two workflows for uh, the next uh, cup, uh, six months, and then we will try to go to new workflows. Thanks, Theodore. Massimiliano? Well, actually, yeah, you, you basically have, uh, you, you already answered, yeah, the idea is that, yeah, we would like to to keep it going. Um, we, are, we, we are interacting with our colleagues, as you said, um, of Gravity Spy. So definitely the idea would be to continue and to offer new challenges as well. Okay, thanks, Max. 
So uh, I hope that that's uh, answered the, to, to some degree, answered the, the question. Um, if possible, uh, Manolis, have you got a good connection with us at the moment? I'm not sure Manolis has a, has, a, has a problem with his connection, so it doesn't matter. Okay. I'm, I'm assuming that the answer to that is no. Um, okay. Another question that I wanted to, to, to bring to the floor was something that we, we, I highlighted earlier in terms of the, the issue of, of uh, as Max mentioned before, uh, clarity and, and uh, clarity of, of language and making language accessible. Now, um, the Gwich Hunters project in particular was something of a precursor uh, in this uh, in this sense, in that it was the first of the four uh, projects to provide a version of the uh, the text of the, the 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 project in a language that was uh, not English. So the 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 uh, documentation was translated into Italian. And we subsequently, uh, Beatrice has, has, and her team have worked very hard on also providing Spanish versions. Some of the projects are now available also in Greek as well. Um, so, um, Massimiliano, what do you what do you think? The how fundamentally important do you think the the translation, the making available of the project in different languages is? I think that having uh, having such a uh, translation, it's a uh, it's a great uh, uh, help for for our citizens, especially because um, when when we're dealing with with uh, with countries where English is not the let's say the most widely um, the language or is not the main language what happens is that uh, the, having uh, having the translation help uh, really to reach everybody which means younger people which means as well older people uh what we what we did uh, for as you were mentioning before is is try to translate the the, the demonstrator in different languages and what we saw is that uh, when we were able to create a copy of the project accessible in in, a, in a various languages this helped a lot in order to have an higher uh, achievement an higher level of, of engagement in that particular country and so we, we really believe that this could be very important if we wanted to engage more and more because otherwise there are people that are not familiar with English, and uh, they simply cannot understand uh, what they 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 should they're supposed to do in this in this demonstrator in these projects. Also, because in some cases, before actually doing something, you need to read some material and uh, some tutorial, for example. And uh, if you're not familiar in in a, in a good le level of English, this might be uh, this might be complicated. So, or this might uh, give rise to some, you know, um, misunderstanding. And so these uh, will, will bias what you're doing with the project. So it's very important to have a clear uh, explanation about what citizens should do. And in this way, uh, having this can have this twofold, uh, uh, you know, uh, achievement in, in one way to engage more people, to engage people uh, belonging to different, you know, range of, uh, you know, ages, uh, experience, etc. And on the other side, to reduce the possible biases related to misunderstanding in, in, in the in language. So I think this is very important and we're very happy to have done this. Thanks, Max. That's very clear. Um, I, I'd like to briefly have a look as well at one more one more issue, and this is something that I think I would like to ask to to Francesco Moreto, um, and it relates to the fact that obviously Reinforce began on the first of December, two thousand and nineteen, and we. 
had a collaboration meeting, we all attended, we met in person. And then, of course, uh, the pandemic hit and all of our plans, uh, this, <laughs> as everybody's plans the world over, uh, were had to be thrown in the bin and, uh, and started again. So, or at least recycled, let's say. Now, Francesco, from the point of view of, you know, the, you're writing the, the, the policy roadmap. Now, do you think that virtual communities can function as effectively uh, as, uh, as physical communities? You know, uh, the more uh, technology advances, uh, the more the difference between online and offline gets, uh, gets narrow. Still, uh, there is a kind of uh, part of uh, tacit knowledge, let's say, that is very difficult to vehiculate uh, online. Uh, also, because we, we people, we, um, we also understand some hints that are more, let's say, related to the body, the, the way that people move. But uh, I think that um, uh, online tools, uh, digital tools, uh, help, of course, help a lot meeting live every now and then so having a kind of a hybrid setup in which uh, you meet uh, uh, let's say 10 percent of the time live would help uh, would help of course even though the you know the pandemics has uh, really boosted a lot the development of digital tools um, so let's say that from one side <laughs> digital tools allow uh, people that is very very far away to participate which otherwise would not have probably the means to, to participate. And they are not completely uh, total substitutes, but uh, you know, they, they are a great, uh, great help. Thanks, Francesco. Yeah, I think I, I find, find myself in complete agreement uh, with that. Okay. I think that more or less we have, uh, you know, we've, we've con 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 we have concluded our roundtable session uh, at this moment. Uh, I think we're, you know, we're on schedule more or less. Um, so I uh, would just like to uh, run through a few sort of closing thoughts to, to conclude the, the session. Um, First of all, I'd like to thank everybody who's participated, you know, Francesco Zimanti for the work uh, with Trust IT. Uh, it's done a great job all the way through the project in, in, in handling so many different, uh, different tasks, not just the dissemination stuff. There's been so much work on graphic design and on great organizational skills as well that have been really important to Francesco Moreto, who's been uh, uh, quietly working away behind the scenes on the policy roadmap all the way through the you know the, the, the last uh, last three years and contributing as well beyond that in work package 10 the dissemination and obviously to Theodora Max who've done a great job uh, on developing their, their projects we were unfortunately we didn't have the the chance to have uh, members of the other uh, demonstrator projects with us today but certainly um, uh, Gwen, Gwen Halder de Vassage uh, at uh, UC Louvain has done a, a fantastic job there, uh, bringing the the project uh, into uh, to, to life, uh, and also we're you know, we're missing the the the, the work pack, our work package five the, the new particle search at CERN uh, team. So that's uh, Christine uh, uh, Kokomelis, uh, Stelios Angelodakis, and, and Stelios uh, Vorakis who have worked so hard on, on work on that, that project to try and bring a very very complex concepts to uh to make them as accessible as, as possible also uh, should make a special mention to another work package three of witch hunters a team member that we don't have with us today and that's uh, francesco di renzo who's worked worked extensively as well uh with max uh on, on not only developing the project but also on uh, engaging with uh, with people locally and internationally uh, uh, to, to, to promote it um, 
we have, of course, Manolis with us as well, Manolis Chaniotakis, who's done uh, all of this work on identifying and uh, developing engagement strategies and continues to work so uh, so uh, so hard in, in that area. Uh, and we uh, sadly didn't have the, the opportunity to have either uh, Claudia Magdalene Fabian or uh, Elizabeth uh, Unterfrauner from ZSI uh, in, in Austria, who've done uh, so much work in the evaluation work package of the project and are still continuing to, to do the work now. Obviously, this is an important period for the evaluation. And uh, I, I would like to also say a big thank you to Beatrice who's uh, been a constant uh, throughout the, the project, working on the sonification uh, uh, work package. A lot of a lot of work being going on there, a lot of getting up very early in the morning to attend meetings uh, and uh, promoting Reinforce in South America, all across South America. We've been, we've been very uh, uh, privileged, I think, in that sense, to have uh, somebody so capable to, to, to help us there. And uh, I, I can't not mention at this point either uh, Francesca Spagnuolo and, uh, and the project coordinator Stavos Katsanevas, who uh, Francesca has been our, our project officer and continues to, uh, you know, to, 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 to drag us all across the line with, uh, you know, to make sure that we meet the various deadlines that we need. And uh, Stavros, uh, who, who has been uh, such an inspiring coordinator for us and uh, uh, has uh, had so many incredible ideas along the way. Um, so I'd like to say thank you to all of you for, for, for taking part. I'd like to, to thank uh, all of our attendees. Uh, it's been very kind of you to, 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 to stay with us, to, to, to give us you know, an hour and a half of your time. On, on a Monday afternoon. Um, I think it's Monday. <laughs> um, so thank you to, to all of you. And uh, so just my final thoughts in general. I mean, I've been the technical manager of Reinforce now for, for the last three years. Uh, so I've been there since the start. And my I think my overriding thoughts on, on this project have been you know, we've talked about co-design. I think it's really important to know the community of people that you're working with. It's really important, I think, to to try and create an environment for these projects in which people think that it's they understand that it's it's okay to ask questions and it's okay to fail. Uh, you know, that's part of the the learning process with them. Um, but it's also important, I think, to know how to engage with people. It's important to know. Like I say, for example, the new particle search at CERN uh, uh, demonstrator project takes very complex uh, ideas, but uh, but makes them accessible to people. And it's really that that ability to render content uh, and, and concepts and ideas that are, are complex, uh, understandable is really important. Beyond that, I think you know, with as with anything. Uh, uh, it requires an investment of time and energy and effort and pro proper curation and, and to, 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 to be successful. Um, but it's also very important to, to recognize, I think, that when when something's not working, that you, uh, you know, certainly in the, in the various, it's been the case at various, with various elements of the project that you invest time in something, you understand it's not working and you have to go back to the drawing board. So that's been a been one of the, the the lessons that I've I've, I've learned uh, working through uh, this experience. So uh, before concluding, I just open the floor. So if, if anybody would like to make any concluding any final concluding comments, then uh, you know please speak now or forever hold your peace. And uh, I see no microphones opening. So in that case, I think uh, I'll draw this session to a close. So thanks again for, to everybody for attending. And uh, please, you know, keep in, you know, following uh, what we're doing. The, you know, the, the, the Reinforce website is there. The, the social media, the, you know, the Twitter feed and so on is all up and running. Uh, and you can get a lot of information from there. Get in touch. Uh, get involved. Thanks again.
Right. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.